Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Linda Marone, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, just um, a housekeeping item. We will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so please write yours in the chat area as they come to mind so that uh, we can start um, getting them ready for our guest. And if we don't have time to answer all, we will make sure that they are available on our site, so not to worry. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get data ready for tomorrow's technology. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, transform legacy and future documents for real needs both today and in the future. As you will see, DCL serves a very broad client base spanning all industries. And now I would like to turn the mic over to Susan Lee to tell you about the Just System. Susan? Thank you, Linda. Hi, everyone. My name is Susan, and I'm the Marketing Specialist at Just Systems. Um, for those of you who don't know, Just Systems is a leading global provider of office productivity, information management, consumer, and enterprise software. Um, in Canada, we are the makers of XMetal, an XML-based software for structured authoring and content collaboration. Um, we serve a broad range of industries as well, um, including aerospace and events, government um, and manufacturing and um, we've been in, we've been recognized for um, industry accolades um, which you can see um, above there and now I'd like to pass it back on to Linda terrific thanks Susan and thank you for co-sponsoring today's uh, webinar we are thrilled today to have Keith Shangley Roberts, an independent data consultant and trainer, and is the guy who talks to people for running Bond software. Keith is going to tell you a little bit about himself before he gets started, and then we will get right into our session, data today and tomorrow. Without further ado, welcome, Keith. Hello there. Hopefully, every, hopefully everybody can hear me. Hello? Is there people there? I have, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. All right, so uh, my name is Keith Shangley Roberts. Uh, I am uh, an, uh, an independent consultant. I work uh, with a firm called Mecon in the UK. Uh, I'm also an, an instructor on information architecture at the University of Toronto. And I've been working with DITA for the better part of the past seven years. Um, so I have. I, been, been around the block several times when it comes to working with DITA, been through uh, uh, DITA 1.0, 1.1, and currently 1.2, uh, uh, and cu currently working on uh, consulting with various clients on uh, ensuring that they're set up for uh, using DITA in, in the workplace is, is optimized. So without further ado, let's talk, let's talk about today's uh, presentation called DITA Today and Tomorrow. Now, by the way, I, I just want to point out I'm actually running this uh, as a, uh, um, a a presentation based on PDF. The original version of this is actually a Prezi-based presentation. I'm just going to flip over to that very quickly. So hopefully you can actually see that. This is a um, uh, just this is my web browser showing you the actual presentation format. Hey. I'm yes. Hello. You're not you're not presenting your screen yet. Oh, okay. Bear with me a moment. Let's try this. Screen is monitor two. And with any luck, you should now see my screen. There we go. There we go. Perfect. OK. Thank, thanks for, telling, for, for letting me know that. So just, just to let you know, if, if people, people want to have a look at this later, this is a, a dynamic um, uh, presentation format. I have used this in a, in a, in a few previous occasions, uh, the last one actually being um, a, pre, a keynote speech that I did at uh, the Data North America conference a couple of months ago. And uh, for a technical reason, we found that the zooming in and zooming out doesn't tend to work terribly well in the webinar format. So as, as a result, we're just going to stick with doing this as a PDF. So without further ado, basically talking about DITA, uh, this will be a survey of 
looking at where data is today, who is using it, how they're using it, and also looking, looking a little bit ahead, trying to understand a bit more about the ongoing evolution of data. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering about you know, who this guy is. And I've already talked a little bit about myself. Let me just finish that off. Um, I am a consultant at Mecon. Uh, I also was formerly the manager for documentation at AMD. Uh, I also, as I say, work as the uh, uh, lecturer on information architecture at the University of Toronto. Uh, plenty of experience with data. I also uh, host an industry blog site uh, at datawriter.com. And um, one of the things on this particular site uh, is, is, a, is a listing of uh, companies that have publicly said that they are, in fact, using DITA for their technical documentation process, which actually looks something, something like this. It's actually, if you go to the actual website, you'll get a listing that, that shows you this. You can actually then go in, um, look up individual company names. You can look up uh, where they're located in terms of their headquarters. Uh, countries and also uh, check out their industry sector. Uh, and, and because I, I want to um, show the work, so to speak, um, there are uh, links in most cases to the actual reference online where, where they it's, it's essentially said that, yes, we are, in fact, using data. Now, a, a little caveat with this is that um, you know this information is uh, it's informal. So this is contacts that I've made uh, that I've reached out to various people at various companies, uh, asking them you know, what, what their data usage is. And it is current as of the date in which I updated the list. So uh, there are some companies here which I know are only starting on the, down the data path, and there are several others that have been doing it for years. I, I just want to mention that because I don't want you to think you know absolutely everybody here has been using data for years and years and years. In many cases, it's 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 a bit, it's a bit of both. Uh, you know, uh, firms at both ends of the you know, data usage spectrum, so to speak. But a lot of information there, and then please uh, um, take a look at it. And if in fact your firm is not listed, I would be very pleased to hear from you, and uh, would love to uh, add add your company uh, information to to this listing. Uh, the more the merrier. Part of the reason for doing this list is to spread the information that, in fact, other firms are using DITA, and you know, to know, you know, to know that you're in good company. So here's what I'll be looking at: um, doing a very quick review of you know, what DITA is, then looking at some of its strengths, or at least what I, what I think some of its strengths are, and then doing a survey of who is using DITA and also where are they using it. Um, and then I'm going to have some thoughts on what I think is holding DITA back from um, even uh, greater acceptance in the technical writing community, and also using my uh, crystal ball, so to speak, to gaze into the future of where I think DITA is going. Now, this is where I'd also like to thank um, the folks at Ixiosoft. Uh, they actually sponsored the original version of this talk. At, um, uh, at the DITA CMS conference that was held in Montreal. This, that was from a couple of weeks ago. I've since updated the information extensively. So this is, if, if in fact you were at the uh, presentation back in Montreal, you will find many things from this which are in fact are new. I'd like to start things off by talking about some non-DITA XML that's out there. This is something I would dearly like to try someday. This is uh, DITA Light Chi Liquor. In fact, when I went and did an, an initial search when I was on a, uh, a, a trip in Beijing about a year ago, and I did a search on the Chinese version of Google uh, for DITA, this was the very first thing that came up uh, as in, uh, on, on top of everything else. I've never tried this. would love to try it someday. I've never been in a place where they've actually sold it, unfortunately. So if you, if you tried it, let me know if it's any good. Um, there's also a brand of field hockey sticks out there. Um, so these are girl, girls field hockey sticks made by a firm called DITA. They make uh, not just um, uh, the sticks, but all the things that would go with it. So they've got gloves, they've got balls. I, as, and when I was a manager at AMD, I thought seriously about acquiring one of these and, and, and you know, using it as a, a, a motivator, so to speak. <laughs> uh, never, never, never had to use that, of course, but, but you know, it was kind of nice to know that, that, that such a thing existed. Um, another interesting thing is that um, while, I'm, while I know that, in fact, um, Caterpillar, the, uh, the manufacturer of uh, large heavy equipment, uses data for the technical documentation, 
it's also one of their line of engines. So this is in fact uh, um, one of their large deep diesel uh, engines and it's from the DITA series. Uh, not to be confused with their uh, documentation of, of, that uses the same thing. Um, another thing I also ran across is that um, in Spanish, apparently, a translation of DITA comes across, uh, the first definition, as you see here, it says uh, commerce, guarantee, and then surety. And then second meaning in, for in, in terms of uh, meaning of the term in, in the USA is debt. And then in Spain, credit. And I always scratch my head at, at, at meanings number two and number three, and I, I always kind of wonder if maybe you know the difference in those two meanings is part of the reason why Spain is uh, having such a hard time <laughs> these days in terms of the, its its economic strategy. Just it could could Dita be the cause? Well, no, probably not. Um, Dita, of course, is also the, um, a, a name that's like actually quite common for um, as a female first name in in, in Europe. Uh, this is actually Dita Parbo. Um, and she was a um, a silent screen era film actress who was uh, quite quite famous in a number of early uh, French and German films. Um, and because it's also um, a, a female name, it also gets uh, used for things like well, this particular boat, this barge, uh, houseboat, I think it actually is, uh, which apparently cru cruises up and down the Rhine. And of course, um, if you've ever done any sort of search on data at all, I'm sure you are more than familiar with. Um, uh, Ditta volunteers. She always comes up, at least in North Amer uh, in, in Western search engines, as the top hit when you just type in Ditta. Uh, never, never let it be said that uh, you know, Ditta is not sexy because, well, clearly it can be. Moving on, what is Ditta XML? Here's a quick review. So, D D is for Darwin, and that allows for the natural evolution of document types through inheritance and specialization. The IT part is for information typing, which gives you an information architecture for technical documents with the base topic types of concept, reference, and task. And of course, if you're looking, thinking about 1.2, it also includes glossaries. I, I like to keep things simple. Let's, let's talk about concept, task, and reference. And then the A is for architecture. And you know, what is that? It's a model to be built on that encapsulates the best practices for both design and the authoring process. And as you can see, one of the strengths of DITA is reuse. In fact, and in some ways, I'd say that is one of the chief um, strengths of DITA as, um, as a techn technical documentation uh, specification. And technical editors definitely see the value in reuse. Um, certainly in the various clients that I meet with the talking to the individual writers, they, they definitely get the fact that uh, a lot of their colleagues are writing material that um, you know, is very similar in, uh, to what that they themselves are doing, but they don't have a good mechanism to necessarily uh, reuse it properly. And what I found in one of my own, uh, again, relatively informal survey of about 100 users, why are people using DITA? Um, content reuse, far and away the most popular reason for why people want to use DITA. Uh, the other things are also quite interesting. Um, you know, the ROI argument is also quite significant. Uh, localization cost savings for those firms that are um, uh, translating their documentation as well. There's a, a definite and well-known uh, reason for wanting to uh, get, get on data in that regard. But, but uh, what, I, what I believe that the main reason is, is exactly what you see here. Uh, writers understand that you know, data really helps enable content reuse. Um, the interesting thing it's actually uh, one. Sorry, one other interesting thing is I, I note that uh, you know one of the questions is um, is it be, you know are you using DITA because the the tools are mature are, are mature or because you know you really like the CMSs um, and that's actually a really low score. <laughs> so I, mean, I I don't think it's 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 saying that they're not mature tools. Far from it. it it's just saying you know writers are not interested in that end of things as much as they want to be able to reuse. Um, the content, you know, both their own content and those of the other writers on the team. So, you know, writers get that. Writers get that content reuse is, is a big deal and that DITA helps them do it. Now, there are some other advantages for, for, uh, for technical writers. And, and by the way, as you probably know, this is a very um, uh, graphically um, uh, intense, uh, not the right word, it, 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 it graphically, uh, it, it, quite, quite graphic. <laughs> 
uh, presentation. And I was actually looking for images of, of scribes um, and, and writers on um, uh, Wikimedia Commons, where most of these images are actually, actually come from, by the way. And it was funny, because I, I ran across this one and several other of, of some medieval manuscripts of, of writers who were working on, on their own textbooks. And, you know, and in this particular case, you know, there's angel in the background. There's a, you know, it's, clearly this, this fellow is in a nice place. Doesn't look happy at all, does he? Never, never really too sure about that. Maybe, you know, it's because I could, you know, maybe it's because he's not using data. I don't know. But, uh, but in any event, there are, there are advantages for technical writers. One of the chief ones is, of course, less time spent formatting. And, you know, if you're using a, a, a traditional desktop publishing tool, um, chances are you're actually spending a, a good amount of your time not writing, but, you know, changing um, the header levels, um, tweaking uh, the color of a particular font, changing the font. Um, an interesting study that, that I did back about six years ago was I, I, I did a, a test of, of all of the writers on my team and basically had them record over the course of the day exactly how much time they spent doing writing as opposed to straight formatting. What the fascinating thing that came out of this was that fully half their time was spent formatting as opposed to writing. And this was independent of the grade of the writers. So both the the junior tech writer and the senior tech writers on, on, on staff were spending about the same amount of time, um, you know, purely formatting their content. Um, so, you know, one, one, of, one of the advantages of, of this for, for, the, for the writer is that, you know, you, you don't have to spend uh, as much time, you know, changing all the headers from, say, header two to header three because, well, you've just put something else, you know, at, at, at a new header level above that. Uh, having been there myself, you know, I, I realize that that's a an, an incredible pain, and it's really nice to to essentially um, you know let let the fact that uh, you know the fact that um, format is, is is separated from the content you know, really really take uh, take its course in this particular case because uh, that's exactly what Dita does. Um, the other thing, and it's interesting, not all um, managers like me pointing this out, but but I I, I do like mentioning this is that um, it does, in fact, stand out on a resume. Um, I, as, as, a, as a former manager, I can, I, can, I can tell you that, in fact, I lost, um, in my time there, I lost three people um, directly due to the fact that they knew DITA and that other companies wanted their knowledge. Yeah, what was, what was interesting is the, um, uh, in, in, in fact, in, basically, we, 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 trained, we trained them up. Uh, got them up and running, and then other companies realized that they that they were there as a as a resource, and uh, you know, sure enough, they uh, they became a, a hot commodity. So this is something that if um, if if you are in fact you know thinking of going down this particular path, it is in fact something that does stand out on a resume, no doubt about it. It's also easier to get feedback on a topic than on a book. Um, one of the clients that I've been working with of late, it, it's actually quite interesting, they've built their return on investment argument wholly on the fact that in fact uh, the, um, their, their engineering staff is expected to not spend anywhere near as much time um, commenting and revising uh, the actual, you know, the, the books that they were handed by the writing staff before. Instead, the idea is they're just going to send them information directly um, at, at the topic level, have them review that. And, you know, not surprisingly, um, when you just give a, um, a, a, you know, a, a subject matter expert, a SME, an individual topic or two to review as opposed to, you know, here's a 200-page book, some, you know, put it on the desk, uh, you know, please review by next Tuesday. You know, generally speaking, the, the latter option doesn't go down anywhere near as well and you know, maybe you'll hear back in that case, but quite often you don't. So, um, in in fact, the uh, you know the the SMEs do tend to uh, you know uh, really do a, a appreciate having things that are much more directed to to their particular knowledge instead of having them weed through material. And of course, this is better for the for the writers as well because um, you know the response rates tend to be uh, significantly higher in this case. And uh, you know, no nobody likes to be ignored and uh, 
especially after you've delivered, say, a 200-page document to, to somebody and ask them to review it. If you just give them the, the one or two or three topics that they need to actually look at, they tend to be much, um, um, much, much happier to do that, not surprisingly. Now, of course, there are other, several other known advantages of using DITA that uh, corporations also know quite well. Uh, one of this is that you know, re the, the fact that there is significant reuse means that content is not, does not have to be constantly rewritten. Uh, the way I like to put this is that basically the wheel does not have to be re-described. Um, of course, the other advantage with this, um, 1A, so to speak, the other um, correlating advantage is that you know, the, your content correspondingly becomes much more consistent. So in this case, I have a picture of all these various wheels. And it's a question of, well, you know, which wheel are we talking about? Which, you know, individual thing are we describing? And in this case, you just say, okay, it's this one. And then you make sure that that is essentially referenced however you want to do it within your documentation. So you, you all agree that, you know, this is the topic we want, you know, to represent our product or our, you know, a particular concept or reference, however you want to put it. And that is the one that is promoted, just the one. Consistency is, is one of the key things here. Now the other interesting thing is that of course output can also be measured. So when you're using data within a content management system, um, that, that means that you can actually you know, then measure what you're doing much, much more uh, properly than, than, uh, than, than under a, a standard desktop publishing system environment. So and hold on a second, I just want to make sure. Yes, OK. So and, and one thing I like to, to point out is that um, to my mind, uh, as somebody who's done a lot of work on metrics, uh, I find that you can essentially think of topics themselves as being sort of the atomic unit of measurement. Um, you basically want to look at, uh, say, the uh, how many topics are created by an author and how many topics are then, say, say, modified by that same author. Add those two together, and then you can actually come up with some rather interesting results. Uh, here's one. Um, uh, published results from my time when I was at AMD, looking at the collated topics uh, from all of the authors on my team, looking at it uh, at, at a spread from Q3 2007 to Q4 2010. And what was interesting is that, you know, look, looking over, um, you know, more than a year's worth of topic data is that I could then look at this and go, oh, okay, there are clear trends going on here. So it, generally speaking, Q3 uh, certainly for 2008, 2010, tended to be, you know, a, a genuinely busy period. Uh, less so for 2009, but, but that was due to not, you know, not not uh, getting out as many products uh, in in that particular time frame. The interesting thing is that, you know, using data like this as a manager, I could argue um, with upper management saying, you know, look, you know, this is this is um, what we've done in the past. You just added however many new products to our list. That means we're going to be, we, we will need you know, this many more writers to be able to tackle these additional projects. And the thing is that if you have numbers to back you up, your argument is much, much more convincing. Now, the other thing is that you can also show things like, in terms of um, um, actual production, uh, you can also look at you know, how did is actually potentially saving the, the company money. Um, again, you know, oddly enough, this is something that upper management tends to like to hear. Uh, so here, here's another case in point. This is actually looking at the cost per topic um, between 2009 and 2010 with a trend line looking at it. So what, what this is looking at is, is the actual um, uh, aggregate cost per topic uh, for the individual months. And then uh, that was then graphed against the actual wages for the people in the group. Now, as a manager, I knew what that was, but I'm, you know, those numbers are not here uh, for fairly obvious reasons. And you can actually see that there is, in fact, a nice um, linear trend going downwards. And I can say that, generally speaking, uh, at the beginning of 2009, it was costing us about $28 or so to create each and every topic on average. And then by the end of 2010, um, that was down to about $25. So there's a clear, um, you know, things were clearly getting more efficient in that particular case. Uh, and again, this is a sort of argument that tends to go down quite well with, with upper management. Um, there are certainly many other types of uh, metrics that can be applied. I'd actually recommend a forthcoming book by uh, Mark Lewis that is coming out, I believe, 
written in the, the August September time frame, which uh, is looking at a data metrics. He looks at all of the possible uh, ways in which uh, data usage can be measured and and, and used um, by by say management to, um, um, to 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 further the aims of the department. Put it that way. Uh, it very very good work. Uh, very good work. Um, I, I've been. Uh, I was asked to review it, and uh, there's a lot of good information there. So, little little plug from for Mark Lewis. Now, another another key thing there uh, is also realizing that uh, reuse translates to lower localization costs as well. This the argument for this is is again fairly straightforward. I mean, if you end up using uh, the same topic in say English um, from one document to another, not surprisingly, you don't have to retranslate that as much. Now. If you're using things in a, in a more traditional desktop publishing environment, um, because uh, the um, content is not separated from format in that way, you're paying um, you know each and every time significant cost for for doing uh, layout work, even if in fact there's no change to the actual words that that have been made uh, in in, in uh, you know for for a good chunk of the document. Just need a few changes here and there, and you know lo and behold, you actually have to. Uh, do significant reformatting elsewhere. Um, the other thing is that with with um, putting the content within the CMS or other tools that you can actually then leverage in this particular uh, circumstance, and you can actually uh, do things such as you know you, you do much better work on things like what, what's known as fuzzy matching. So you may in fact already have words which have been translated. They may occur together in say uh, pairs or in phrases. And if it, depending on the CMS you're using, it may recognize that and go, "Oh, okay, wait a second. Don't you don't have to retranslate this? That same phrase is used somewhere else, and here's how it was translated that time." In this case, the translation house looks at that. Um, generally speaking, they will then review that work, but that but the cost of the review is significantly lower than having to retranslate it and then say reformat it using a DTB environment uh, from scratch. So, um, and again, the more languages you do. Um, the, the better and better the return on investment argument is for that. Okay, so as a, you know, these are all very good reasons to use DITA. Now, what's interesting is to see um, the spread of DITA usage all around the world. Now, this may not be terribly surprising, but, but from what I've been able to find in my survey, um, almost three quarters of DITA Data users, um, are, in terms of the the, um, the firm's headquarters, are based in North America. Um, outside of that, uh, the next highest group is in Europe with 21 percent, and then following that with um, uh, with Asia with six percent, and then Australia at one, and then as you can see, uh, South America and Africa with a quarter percent each. Now, that, again, this is what I've been able to find. I actually strongly suspect that. Uh, usage in South America is is higher than I'm representing here, at least in part because of the term uh, "data" in in um, in, Sp in Spanish is in fact a, a a a financial term, so it's much harder for me to find uh, information on, uh, on on firms using data in, in a non-financial sense. Just looking at just a bit closer at things, uh, here's actually a quick um, map of uh, the, of the United States, and as you can see, there's a um, a key grouping in uh, on on the West Coast in California, in particular, um, a lot of firms in the Bay Area around San Jose and San Francisco, and then also some further south in uh, LA and San Diego, and then there's another major cluster along the East Coast, um, running roughly from New York City down to um, uh, New Jersey and Delaware, with key pockets in and around Chicago, um, Seattle, and Washington. And also some interest, uh, some areas in in Texas, so Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, uh, and not and not uh, Dallas as well. So some 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 um, uh, key key data database firms are in, in in all of these areas. So uh, with 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 few exceptions, uh, data is is in use um, all over the place in the states. Um, if anybody wants to make a guess as to um, uh, what what types of firms are tend to be uh, using. Um, Using data within within California, um, you know California is probably best known in many respects for the many number of software firms there. And and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but but you'd be right in thinking that in fact uh, the main concentration in in California is 
uh, primarily software firms. On the East Coast, it's actually slightly different, which, which we'll see. In, in Europe, um, again, quite a number of, of, uh, of firms um, using data are based uh, in, an, uh, in and around uh, the UK, uh, primarily in the London area in suburb, in its, in its suburbs, so to speak. Um, but what was interesting is that um, when, I, when I did the work on this, it dispelled the notion, for me at any rate, that uh, DITA is a purely English language phenomenon. Uh, because I, I looked at all of these other firms, and sure enough, um, you know there are many other firms uh, that are clearly not working necessarily natively in English that are using DITA. And actually, I want to flip over, and I'm hoping that you can see this. I'm going to flip over to my browser. This actual map is is um, map uh, was created using a nice online application called Batch Geo. And um, um, the URL is, is present there. I'll make sure that it's available for users at the end of this talk if they want to see it. But if you want to actually go in and see where all the various users are, sure enough, you can actually see, zoom in and see exactly where they are. And I'm zooming in, in this case, on California. Hope you can all see that. And it actually, if you go to the individual marker, it'll say which company is actually represented. And if I go up to, just for fun, go up to British Columbia. Where are we here? All the way up. Here we are. Blue Stream, TELUS, trying to find where Just Systems is located, because I know they're on here somewhere. But in any event, we know they're there. <laughs> okay. Now, the other interesting thing is I wanted to point out is that 6% um, may seem a relatively low number of, of data usage in Asia. But what, again, what, uh, when, I, when I dig a bit deeper, um, this is, uh, the usage in Asia is definitely higher than this number would suggest. So, you know, when I have a look at actual job postings for, say, in this case, India, what I'm finding is that, um, th th you know, there are many uh, many places which are looking for data technical writers. It's just that the companies that they're working for, uh, their headquarters are not located in India. They're, they're various branch offices. And I can you know, further testify to that. I have done uh, data training to technical writers in places like, say, Bangalore um, at, at companies that are not necessarily based there. They just have a branch office. Definitely significant interest in this uh, in places like India, um, also in um, also in Japan, Korea, uh, and Japan, uh, sorry, uh, um, and, and China. China. So there's significant interest in that. And I think we're going to see that grow over time. There's definite um, real interest in, in, in using data in those environments. Um, sadly, though, um, I cannot find any data usage in Antarctica. It seems to be the only continent which has absolutely no data representation that I'm able to find. So. So down there are some you know, data, there's some penguins that have, have no idea about the advantages of doing things in, okay, that makes no sense. Okay, hopefully I've got a laugh. <laughs> now in terms of the actual breakdown, you know, the types of firms which are actually using data, um, you know, this is the, this is the, in, uh, this is the industry uh, breakdown. And, you know, not surprisingly, uh, at least to my mind, given the fact that, um, DITA more or less started off um, in use at firms that were heavily into software, such as, say, IBM. You know, not surprisingly, almost 30% of firms using DITA are, in fact, software-based firms. But it's interesting to look at the spread. Um, you know, what, what else is here? There's also uh, technical documentation solutions. Healthcare information technology is a significant chunk. Uh, education and training, including several universities, which I found quite interesting. Uh, semiconductors, telecom, uh, computer hardware, finance, uh, consumer electronics, uh, the petroleum industry is also big into DITA. And by the way, given the numbers we're talking about here, you know, one percent does not equal one firm. It, it generally has to equal at least uh, three or four. So there, there's some, some significant numbers going on here. So to some example, firms of software firms that, that um, have, have said that they're using DITA include the ones you see here, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some very familiar names that you'll see here. Um, similarly, you know, those who are doing technical documentation solutions, these are firms 
um, who are in the business of providing uh, technical documentation uh, services on behalf of clients. So not surprisingly, they want to do things efficiently. Therefore, they're on you know they're on top of doing this sort of thing as well. Um, by the way, consultants also also sort of figure into this particular area, and um, you know that's that, that's in part where my firm me me come figures in. But the same goes true for several other firms represented here. Um, then also education and training services. So um, you know a couple of the universities that you see here are using it for um, some of their um, particular training efforts. They find. Um, the interviews, the informal interviews I've done with a couple of people at these at these places are finding uh, that the learning and training specialization is exactly what they want. So that's you know they're very heavily invested in that particular area. So it's some real interest in that. Um, and then also, uh, in to my mind, almost a little bit surprising that healthcare information technology and one of the things is that I, I think uh, bodes well for data in general is the fact that. Um, it, it is gaining high usage in this particular sector because, generally speaking, they are under um, um, other strictures to make sure that what they're presenting in terms of information is is accurate. Because you know, let's face it, if, if, you know, a life and death situation, you want to make sure that your documentation is is as accurate as possible. And it's nice to see that that data can can clearly fulfill that need. Um, there's also a number of semiconductor firms. Of course, that that. You know that looks into a bit, a bit of my background, so AMD is certainly represented there. Um, you know, but many other firms are here: ARM, Nvidia, uh, Texas Instruments, ST Micro, and Freescale. And what was interesting is that when I dug, you know, compared that list of, of all the firms that, that in the semiconductor business to iSupply's ranking of the top 20 semiconductor firms, um, you know, at least half of those firms are using DITA. Um, and, and I say at least half, and, you know, that what you see there is half. I strongly suspect that um, most of the rest are using it as well, but I can't find public information to that effect. So um, it, in at least one segment, it seems like data is dominant in terms of uh, technical communication. And I suspect that that may be true in other areas too. But give me more, give me more time and research, I'll see if, I can, see if that can be proved to be true. Um, a number of telecom firms are, are doing data. Um, uh, uh, RIM, Avaya, Motorola, Hughes, uh, True Position, Nokia, and and also Apple. Uh, though I, I I lump that into with one with one of the other um, um, uh, uh, one of the other firm uh, uh, groups from an earlier slide. Um, and then looking at other ones, financial services, uh, PayPal, Mastercard, FICO, Jack Henry, they all use DITA. Um, well, there's Apple again, and Consumer Electronics, uh, Samsung as well, TomTom, the uh, um, Manufacturer of um, uh, uh, geolocation units and also uh, petroleum companies, uh, PTRC, uh, Schlumberger, Chevron, uh, Tesoro are all using it as well. So it's interesting to see the spread. But then you're probably kind of wondering at this point, well, what about that other 23% I saw on the pie graph? Well, you know, what's interesting is that it represents a myriad of other firms that uh, in, in a number of other different categories. And you know, and, you know if, if you look at, at this listing of companies, and this is not a complete listing by any, you know, this is sort of me cherry picking some of the better known ones. But you know, in, in this listing, of, this listing alone, you're looking at say office products, uh, injection molding, machine tools, uh, heavy equipment manufacturers. In fact, if anything, heavy equipment manufacturers seem to be the you know the next up and coming out uh, segment um, in in data usage from what I'm able to find. Uh, aerospace and defense. Uh, energy production, uh, wind turbine manufacturers, uh, mining, uh, plumbing fixtures. You probably see uh, where is it? On? Yeah, Kohler. That's that's <laughs> that's that's them. Um, uh, online bookseller. That would be Amazon. Uh, supercomputing. Cray. Cray is is using uh, data in, in, for for their documentation efforts. Um, Prepress hardware. Um, exercise equipment. Um, that would be Nautilus. Uh, sensor manufacturers, um, cloud computing, geoimaging, and marine navigation. That's what the Konigsberg one at the bottom is. So many, many different firms using data. And it was, I found it very interesting to see this very widespread of firms using data for, for their own purposes, uh, which tells me, at least in part, you know, you know, I have to wonder, you know, why is there such diversity in this particular case? And the more I delve into it, you know, I, I think this quote from Darwin, Really, you know, bring, brings 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 it brings it up. Uh, you know, he was trying to explain 
essentially that you know it, it's not the it's not the uh, the fact that it's the strongest of the species that survives necessarily. Trying to clarify that you know best that well-known statement. Um, you know, it's not the, the strongest or, or nor the most intelligent that survived. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I think that's one of the key things that, that also applies to Dida. It is highly adaptable. I think based on that is part of the reason why we're going to see, you know, it's going to continue on. You know, it allows for the natural evolution of document types through inheritance and specialization. Therefore, flexibility built right into the system. And you know, it's also adaptable to specific environments. And I think one nice case of that is looking at the various technical subcommittees, uh, which are you know looking at specializing data for particular sectors. So we see um, you know the the data semiconductor uh, um, group, the data machine industry, uh, the data learning content, and the translation subcommittee. You know, they're all playing a very significant part. And I suspect that over time, we're going to be seeing more of these types of groups. So you know, here's my first. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm out there. Um, big, big prediction. You know, I suspect DITA will in fact be quite a long, long-lived specification. Um, we'll, 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 I, I, hopefully, this will not haunt me in, in 10 years plus time. But you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I think that it's a fair enough thing to say that it will certainly be around for some time to come. Now, what about some of the challenges to DITA? Because there are some. And you know what I'm finding is that it has less to do with competing XML standards, which you know what a lot of people might think, and has more to do with technical limitations with data adoption within the firms which are trying to implement them. So you know while anybody, just about anyone, can adopt data, um, there are some real challenges that remain. So you know, one of the chief ones I find is that we need to make formatting output much easier. You know, here you have a you know standard. The, the, the idea is straightforward. You have XML. You 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 merge it with some XSLT. You uh, then process it through the pro, uh, SSLT processor, and hey hey presto, you get a document. Um, but of course, anybody who has looked you know done this uh, above and beyond the data OT realizes that you know much like a fine Swiss watch, the workings of the XSL process can be both intricate and in some cases can be costly. Um, there are often, you know, firms that actually have a significant data um, um, uh, back background or, or makeup. Quite often, will have dedicated programmers working on the XSL con content. So, um, for something for smaller firms, that is a real impediment to progress in that area that I'm finding. Um, there are also some places where data is perceived as too complex, and this was a a nice sample um, email I found in a forum, which I think. Um, you know, puts across the, the argument quite well. Um, you know, in some ways, in fact, there's, there's there's a lot of talk that in fact maybe it's it's expanding too fast. Um, there's there's you know, in in some ways, the, you know, the vast number of uh, new tags and you know, fairly complex ideas such as um, rel tables and uh, con key refs and so forth are, can actually um, you know, uh, does not make for a compelling argument for simplicity, <laughs> put it that way. Um, now, the thing is that, of course, when you when you cut things down to you know what writers actually need, they no, almost always need a a particular subset of the data XML spec to work with. But it's hard to know that when you're just starting from scratch. So this is a perception which I hope over time will you know um, again through presentation like this, people will understand that that's in fact not the case. You know, and to, to get over this hurdle, and to then you know, realize that, in fact, you know, data, data is is not as complex as you might first think. It it is, um, it, it's not so much complex; it is diverse. Put it that way. And there's a lot that you can actually do with the material um, that's there. But you can start off small, um, and 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 again, you know, just uh, keep it to a minimal set of tags that you actually need to use instead of say adopting the, the full lear learning and training specialization if in fact you're not uh, going down that particular path right away. Now the other thing is that I'm also finding that DITA, it may not be still fully mature within in, in the industry. Now this this slide on the next slide is courtesy of Common Sense Advisory. They are a group um, that actually market um, their services to uh, translation sur um, buyers. and in this particular case, they did a, a survey of various translation firms 
um, a localization service providers, that's what LSP means in this case, that process data content. And um, they asked um, you know, a, a rather large number of, of LSPs, 867. This, so this can be considered you know, definitive. And this, by the way, is information from, from about this time last year. So it's still relatively current. And, you know, and they asked them what percentage of LSPs process data content for their clients. And um, more than half said we don't process data, period. The next most segment is also interesting. What's data? Almost 30% of those firms. Yikes. Isn't that interesting? And yet the remaining 15% they knew what it was and you know, presumably are coping with it very well. And, and I'm, I'm expecting, of course, that that particular slice will grow over time. But even after all this many years, there are still you know, translation firms out there that still you know, don't, not only you know, don't process it, but still are you know, basically saying, you know, what is that? So we haven't quite hit that, um, haven't quite, quite hit that uh, uh, level of maturity is yet, and 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 for for the slide that sort of backs up that point, how big are these firms? Um, again, it didn't actually seem to matter a whole lot. Um, the firms that actually processed it were almost any size. Um, it's not surprisingly, the largest firms tended to be the ones that all that processed it, and that's at thirty six percent. But the spread after that was actually fairly even. After that, so again, I, and and again, I'm I'm also hoping that increased demand over time will solve this type of problem. Now the other thing is also getting social media right uh, in terms of using data with it. Um, my colleague Nas Urbina at Nikon uh, has, had had this to say: you know, we we have to make it clear to our clients that it's all about collaboration and efficiency, not you know cute videos of kittens. That's not what it's about. Um, but things have to be done right. You can't just put and I have seen this. You know, put a put a like tag on my document. You know, that's not really the way it's likely to work. So one nice thing I've seen is actually. Um, um, a product called Data Web, where you can actually throw in, you can actually open up the database to comments um, from the users, and this actually works in a native uh, data environment. Um, I, I think we're going to be seeing more more of this sort of thing in the future. I realize I'm running out of time. I'm going to uh, speed things up a little bit. All I want to say, just to conclude this point, is that you know social media is clearly here to stay, but you know we need to make sure that content can be found and made is, is relevant because otherwise we, meaning the technical writers, may go the way of the dodo. Very sad looking dodo there. Another quick challenge, I also find that technical writers need to be relevant. Um, this is actually a picture of my um, clothes washer, a Kenmore Series 90, if you remember right, and uh, it stopped working uh, properly one day. When I went Googling the information, I found that in fact there was a YouTube video that explained things quite thoroughly. And I went to that video and it told me everything I needed to know. I didn't have to go to the documentation because the video told me all I needed. Um, so technical writers need to realize that you know users have powerful publishing tools available to them and that we're now competing in some ways with our users to make sure that we get you know our, our point across. And what that means is that we need to be relevant. You know, information is useless if it can't be found and retrieved. Um, when I did further digging, because as a, as a good information architect, I went, it's like, okay, where is the documentation on this? And you know, sure enough, I did find it. And this was about about six or seven Google page views into it, and I found it eventually. And did it list my particular problem? No, it didn't, and it didn't have any information on how I could solve it. The YouTube video was far and away better. <laughs> so, so again. Technical writers need to stay relevant. We need to be in contact with their audience. Now, you know, now I want to look at a little bit into the future of, of where I see data is going. And of course, one of the things that everybody's asking about is, you know, what about tablets? And it's, you know, again, um, tablets are clearly here to say. And, and the, you know, we have here uh, uh, an iPad. We have a, a um, uh, we have the uh, the BlackBerry device. And in the upper right is the uh, uh, the forthcoming. A Windows 8 based tablet that Microsoft is definitely going to be pushing. It's, it's clear that technical documentation is going to be much more mobile. And again, one of the things I think is one of DITA's strengths is the fact that um, you know, DITA in, in this topic based approach um, you know, can, you know, puts across chunks of information 
which can be easily digested, you know, one page screen at a time, in which case I think it's ideally suited for tablet use. Um, QR codes and data, yes, I think arguably where it makes sense to do so. I've heard of, in some cases, some manufacturers inserting QR codes that then point essentially to in individual topics on a web server, which can then be used. Um, another interesting thing is that an increasing amount of internet traffic is non-human. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at this, um, you know, some of it is okay, you know, due, due to things like, you know, spam and all the rest of it, but what's interesting is that um, a number, you know, it's an increasingly large number of, say, search engine derived and, and automated searches uh, and spidering and so forth is going on, which means that semantically displayed content will become even more important and will ought to be more relevant in various searches in the future because of this. So, you know, in some ways you're writing not only for the human users, but also for, um, you know, for, for um, uh, semantic processing by, by machines that understand it. Um, you know, this, this is part of the reason why getting short descriptions right in data is, is really key. Um, another thing to watch for is that, you know, there are many more devices uh, coming down the pipe soon that are situationally aware and will respond accordingly. So, in other words, you know, they'll know when you're looking at them and when they're, you're seeking information from them. And again, having a topic-based approach, having information in small chunks seems to be what's needed for this environment. Now, this is, we're only at the very beginning of this. This is another sort of mini, mini revolution. I think we're going to be seeing much more, much more in the next two or three years. Um, ultimately, when you look at these various, um, you know, things impinging on the future, what I'm finding is that it's still ultimately all about meeting the user's needs when and where they need it on demand. So I think DITA's topic-based approach to static data is clearly working well and is here to stay. And again, part of the reason for this, you know, is also looking at the information typing, looking at the individual task structure. You know, this, this part has been, I think, has been really, it's been got right. And while nothing is future-proof, data is less likely to be replaced by something that is wholly new. It's much more likely that whatever comes next is going to evolve from data's very sound fundamentals. Um, the other thing I want to mention just before uh, mention this before concluding is that I, I really do think that data birds of a feather really ought to swim together. So you know, please everybody keep up the dialogue outside of these uh, webinars and conference sessions that you might attend. And that that is it for me. Terrific. Thank you, Keith. We do have some questions that came in, and I believe we have some time that we could handle at least a couple. Um, sure. Again, Keith will be answering any that we do not get to today so that we can have them published and ready on our website for you. Um, we have one, and this came in uh, about halfway through, Keith. I think you did address some of it, but I think it's mm. important. Benefits described so far are common to XML generally. So what is so special about the DITA flavor of XML? I, I, again, I, I think that the topic-based approach is, you know, the, the idea that topics need to essentially stand, stand alone. They, they, they must bring their context along with them. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I've, I've been looking at in, in firms that have been going from, say, a, um, um, a, a, a book, um, uh, a, 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 a doc book format um, migrating to DITA is that the, the, the key shift is away from a narrative style to a, a much more topic-based style. And that's a, that's a real shift for the writers. It's, 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 it's a real change. But once they get that, uh, and especially when it, when it's combined with something like uh, with minimalist writing principles, um, it you know you get much bigger bang for the buck. You have better reuse um, all around, um, and and again you know better um, again you know putting my my information architect hat on again, much better, um, much better at conveying information to the users in a compact and useful form. Um, there there was one. Um, case that, um, that that I did again again at AMD, we had a um, sort of like a Bible-like document, and it was very much initially in sort of the narrative format. It was about typically 600, 800 pages long. Um, after doing a full up content inventory, doing full IA work on it, and didifying it, 
we shrank that down to a document that was often about two, three hundred pages. You know, you know, more, more, uh, at least half to, to more than half that size of the original document. And what was interesting is that over time we realized that um, the document was in fact, um, you know, was actually being used much more than uh, than previously. Um, we, we, you know, tech writers tend not to hear uh, praise for their documents. I mean, that's part of our life, I think, really. But um, but you know, tech, tech, uh, but tech writers always hear complaints. We didn't hear any complaints from that at all. And we were expecting them. So so what was interesting is that you know, we, we we figured there was a, a real net gain in that in that environment. Yeah, I think that answers that question. Yeah, one thing, I, if I might add to that also from uh, our experience in talking with our clients is that because every company today is basically a publisher and, and almost all companies are looking at multi-channels uh, for publishing their content, where XML is certainly flexible, DITA allows them to take specific chunks of content and use it in specific ways where they may not want to take everything. And it just exactly. makes it much easier to move that content around and be able to, as you said, multi-purpose it accordingly. I, again, another example which illustrates that point is that I, I remember being pleasantly surprised finding that uh, a, a concept topic that was being used in this Bible document, which was aimed, um, I thought, at electrical engineers, was actually then repurposed uh, quite well <laughs> in an end-user document. Um, you know, exact same concept. Why, why re-describe it twice for different audiences when you, if you do it once, it works in both quite well. Well, that's exactly what happened. Correct. Excellent. Um, another question, Keith. What is the typical adoption period in months from the point where a company has the tools to do DITA to when its writing staff is fully engaged and effectively writing in a DITA model? This should be interesting. I'm actually to hear your Wow. Your okay. That's a, that's a good <laughs> question. And... Um, I, I think that the, the 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 safe answer for me on that would be you know it depends, uh, <laughs> um, but but to uh, but 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 seriously the um, it, it it really you need to think about you know what is the size of the team is it if it's one writer for example writing you know against one product then the transition can be you know loading up the data OT and starting to use that I mean I have I've actually seen that. Uh, so the transition period in that case would be, you know, uh, you know, a week or two, <laughs> so to speak. But, right, right, but, but right. realistically, that's that's not what most people are facing. We're looking at a team of writers, and uh, you know, usually several um, deliverables and products at once. What I what I find is the smart way of doing things in this environment is um, to make sure the writing staff has uh, sufficient time to adjust. Um, you might want to, uh, you know, nominate a few people uh, in in the team as being, you know, the leads to to make, you know, to forge ahead, come up with, you know, templates for, you know, how how a data document ought to look like, and then over time let the other people on your writing staff then convert over to the new format. Um, in and in, in a couple of cases that I can think of, um, the the transition from desktop publishing tools to producing um, first production quality document in DITA was, and you know, and this may seem like a long time, but believe me, it's not. It was six months. I can think of at least two solid cases where that was the case. Um, now, of course, they were. They, it's not that they they stopped producing documents during that time. They in fact had had to do both. They had to do the DTB and the database docs at the same time. But um, but but the the longer the transition period, the more comfortable um, the writers become um, writing in the new format and using whatever tools they're using to to make that happen. And you know the the greater the success from from what I from what I've seen. So um, again, you know, and you know that 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 is for two firms that I can think of where you know we're looking at writing staffs. Um, in the several dozen in size and geographically uh, dispersed over um, North America and Europe and China uh, in this particular case. So, so you know, lots of additional challenges there. So, you know, your your results may vary depending on size and and uh, um, in intent, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Um, 
on that note, is data implementation more suitable for small team for a small team rather than a decentralized team structure? I would say that it's it's um, I'd say in some ways it's actually equally good for both environments, but for different reasons. Um, in the, with very small teams, um, you know, it, it's it's easier for them to more or less turn on a dime and and you know change over to doing things in that particular way. But um, for large firms with geographically dispersed writers, um, the key thing for them in some ways is then being able to share information. They're de-siloing the writing staff. Um, so again, when you one of, one of the nice things is you know you, you, there's sort of the built-in ser serendipity of, of using data within, say, a, a content management system. Because then the writers can go searching for content that somebody else has written. And then if they see that, it's like, oh, OK, that's all I need. I'll, then I'll, I'll just conref into that, or I'll, I'll make a copy of that, and I'll use that particular topic uh, in my map. And I'll, you know, it, it then saves them the time of having to rewrite that. And again, it's, it's you know, in, in, for larger firms, there's, there's um, you know, serendipitous reuse for for very small teams, it, it's it's much more down to you know getting, you know making sure that everybody's working on a common platform. In some ways, that's in some ways that's almost a more important thing for for teams of you know that are you know say small than uh, smaller than five in this particular case, and who terrific. may or may not be using a CMS. Yeah, terrific. I think that's very very helpful. Well, thank you, Keith. Um, I thank you everyone for attending. I will let you know that Keith will be um, authoring an article related to the same topic for our September newsletter. So if you're not already a subscriber, please make sure that you do sign up. Um, I think it's uh, you know going to kind of continue on in the same vein and give you a little bit more. Uh, more feedback, certainly incorporate your questions. This concludes today's broadcast. I want to thank Just Systems as our co-sponsor and value partner. And uh, to let you know, you will be able to access the recorded version from the webinar archive section of dclab.com. Also, please join us for our third webinar in the Ask the Experts series on Wednesday, July 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Keith.